I think I'm at the end of this sort of labor and delivery process of God breaking this stronghold. And I just want to share with you that that truly is what it feels like. Like when you get to the point where, you know, your, your thinking is really kind of getting loopy because you're up against the wall. God is just getting there. He's squeezing every last bit of it out. So I just want to let you know that. It starts out like you enter into something that he's bringing you to understand or to root out. And then you start questioning everything. Those contractions get closer and closer together. Then you get to that point where you're like, I I can't take it anymore. You just feel dead sometimes. And other times you're like, I I can't do this anymore. He's going to root it out. It really is a labor and delivery process. But you have to keep standing. You got to keep standing in faith. And this particular thing has so many things connected to it. There's that, there's the issue of trusting him in a way that I didn't trust him in my life. I didn't know him in that way. I thought that what I was doing was right. You know, I thought that because I learned that from the world. I learned from the world that like you go to school and you go to work and that you do that for the world, right? And I went into a profession thinking I was going to help people. And then you go through all that training and you look around and you're like, is, is anyone actually helping or are they just helping themselves? You realize how disgusting helping professions are, how fake and false they are for the glory and the greed of the, the people in it. I mean, that's the truth. I've told you stories about it. It's disgusting and there's no healing. And if the people in it were doing their own work, they would know that. So there's that. There's me trusting him to provide in this way with all of the things that I've given up, all of the things that he stripped me of, holding on to the promises of what he has said to me directly, what he has also said in his word, who he was, who he is, and who he will be. That's his name. And there's also everything else that's associated with it. That what will happen when I sell this last bit of property in order to live on uh, during the time that I'm here is I will dissolve my corporation. I will dissolve my LLC. I will dissolve my license. I will no longer be connected to anything in this world, anything that I sold myself to in this world. It's pretty big. So it's almost like, I mean, I'm, I'm likening it to labor and delivery. I'm also likening it to like the finale of a fireworks show. Like that's what it feels like. I'm getting bang, 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 you know, like just hit with those explosions constantly, overwhelmed, bombarded. And I know that the devil's not able to do anything that God is not using. So I know that when those things are coming at me, and they are like one after another, I know that what he's doing is he is shaking this frame to make sure that this structure is going to stand. There can't be a crack. There can't be a gap, a loose screw, nothing. It's got to be solid. So that's what I'm going through right now. And I'm going to continue to take you with me as I'm standing in faith, because I think it's important that you know that maybe I sound like I've got it together, but all throughout the day, this is what I'm going through at this point in this, in this phase of what he's doing with me. That's what I'm going through. Like it's all day long. It's all day long. I, you know, my, my journaling, it's like, I'm giving you the last bit of what I've got, Lord, please give, enable me, give me more strength to keep going. Help me endure, help me to stand, help me to hold on to what you've done because those, those doubts, those accusations, like the, the enemy's bringing that stuff right now, full force. But here's what you need to know when the enemy's doing that and he will, You have to know fundamentally that God is the one who's sovereign and that even in that story of Job that you're, that he demonstrated that the enemy couldn't bring anything in the, um, except for what God said, God's the one who set the parameters. And at the very end of that story, when Job's multiplying his words against God, what did God say? Who is this who obscures my plans with words without knowledge? So he's saying, this has been my plan. This is not the enemy's plan. This is my plan. I do all these things. If I know that, if I know that this is God's plan, I'm not going to get freaked out. I mean, believe me, there's like a part of me that's like, you know, this is so uncomfortable inside, but I'm not freaked out in the sense of, you know, God doesn't have this, like he doesn't have a plan here or that anything 
could go wrong without that being his plan or that the enemy can bring anything that God is not using in order to test and in order to free me of the bondage that I sold myself to. I know why this is so intense. I know that it's intense because he's going to reveal his glory, because he's teaching me how to be an offering, because he's teaching you how to be an offering, how to recognize an offering. I know that it's all that. And I also know that it is because he is freeing me of those strongholds. He is requiring me to do the work that is required in order to demonstrate my choice and my faith here in my covenant. If you don't do that, you're not fulfilling your covenant. We're so deluded in counterfeit Christianity to think that Jesus just did all of that for us. How can you prove that you have faith if you haven't proven that you have faith? If you're not proving that you're not choosing those idols anymore and that you are going to trust God even when, even in situations that seem impossible where you think that you've got to go choose something that you can see over what you can't see, but what you can't see has all power. I trusted in the goals that I had in this world. I looked around at other people who claim to have success, who look, according to this world, to have success. I trusted in what I couldn't see, and I kept striving in the world. And then I got there and realized how dirty it was, and I tried to survive in it. I mean, where do you go when you get to that point? You got student loans? Like, where are you going to go after the last 10 years of working on your doctorate? My daughter made the right decision. She got her doctorate, and she decided to stay home with her child. She saw the disgusting things that were going on in that field. But see, I didn't have any examples here. My daughter has had me as an example. She's been able to see that I went into the field, I built successful careers, and God pulled me out. And she listened right away. She listened right away when God said, uh-uh, no, this is not for my child. This is not good. This is not right. This is not of me. I didn't have that example. And honestly, I kept trying to make something that was filthy. I kept trying to make it good. Kind of like what we do in counterfeit Christianity, trying to take that mud pit and make it good, right? Like, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to take what is good and leave the rest. It doesn't work that way. We have to fully commit ourselves to God. We have to walk away from the things that are obviously not of him. And that's what I've done, but it's left me with, with nothing concrete, you know? It's left me with where I started in the beginning, which is, you going to trust me now? You going to trust that doing the right thing in this world, that God can cut through everything else, that he can take care of me? You know, I want to tell you something else, you parents. You've probably had this experience as well and can understand from your own experience. But as a parent, you got to change this pattern if this is what you experienced when you were growing up. I had parents who talked a lot about faith, who kind of bullied you into a relationship with God. And I really did want to trust and believe in God. Like I really genuinely as a child pursued that. But I had parents, particularly a father, who betrayed my trust, taking that desire and coveting it for himself, just like the devil does. I mean, if you got the devil in you, that you're going to do what the devil does. And he took that innocence and he took that trust that I had and the desire that I had to do the right thing. And he took it for himself and used it to hurt my mother, used me as a weapon to hurt my mom. And you know, after so many times of trying to do the right thing and getting beat up like that, you start to think, as a child, you start to realize, yeah, that's all good in theory, that if you do the right thing, you'll be taken care of. But the truth is that if you do the right thing, you're vulnerable. If you do the right thing, you're going to be taken advantage of. You're not going to be taken care of. And that's what I learned early on. And that's a darn shame because I've had to work really hard to get my way back to a real relationship with God, to the truth in him. And I want to say to you what Jesus said about that. Woe to anyone who causes these little ones to stumble. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Can you understand why that's so serious? To destroy the innocence of a child? To covet the innocence and the goodness and the purity that's meant for God? We're supposed to be shepherding them to give all of that as an offering to God to trust him with all their hearts. And so to be a parent who obliterates that in a child, what do you think is in store for someone who does that, who covets that for themselves? What do you think is the spirit that does that? And a lot of you have been through situations like this because of the increase in wickedness. Because from one generation to the other, there's no healing. Tomorrow night, we're doing a sort of question and answer. So usually on Monday nights, we have a workshop 
but there are some people who are still kind of on the fence about whether they should be doing this work, want to do this work. If you don't heal, you're not in your covenant. God uses healing synonymously with salvation. And so it's really important that you understand that, number one, you have to return to him. And I'm not talking about like do a modified, you know, a modified something, give up something like you are like you do with Lent or something like that. Like, oh, well, I'm going to give up sugar and, you know, then God will, then I'll return to God and he'll return to me. No, you give up sugar, but you go distract yourself on technology, occupy yourself with the radio or television or food. You can't do that. You got to give up all of the idols. You got to sit down and be single minded and return to him and occupy yourself with him for three days or he's not going to return to you. You don't return to him. He won't return to you. You can't make a liar out of God because he says that if you return to him, he'll return to you, that he will not turn away anyone who comes to him. So if he's not returning to you and you're not hearing from him and you're not walking with him, that's on you. It's not because of him. And you need a way to understand how to do that. And it'd probably be nice if you had a support system that's all also living like that because I know you don't have that in the world. A support system that maybe walked before you has a little experience with doing this work. But the first thing you have to do is return to him because that's what he says in his word. Return to me and I will heal you. You have to return to him or he will not return to you and there will be no healing. So a lot of times when people start trying to do this work on their own, they take my book and they use it incorrectly. They do it in their flesh. They think that, you know, because they're doing some sort of modality that that's what's going to heal them. And they're trying to take control of doing that work for themselves. But that's not what it's about. That's not, that is not the intention of the work. You're missing the point. The point is to do the work that you're required to do in personal accountability so that you can bring yourself to God correctly so that you can bring yourself to him in accountability, in humility, in submission, reliance, and obedience, and so that you can heal with him in the specific process that he has for you. You know, a lot of times when you're looking for experts to help you through these things, you think, man, I just need someone who really gets me, right? Who's going to give me like this treatment protocol that's going to be person specific, like they're just going to get all of me. And you don't even realize that you have that in the one who created you. He designed you specifically for a purpose. He's known how he's been building you this entire time. That is what you need to believe. And if you believe that, then you'll walk with him and he will walk with you. So tomorrow we're going to get together and, you know, whoever has a testimony is going to share their testimony. Whoever does not have a testimony is going to be quiet because... And, and I, don't, I don't mean that to, be, to say that in a mean way, but what I mean to say is you don't open your mouth if you don't have a testimony because it wastes the time of other people and God doesn't testify to it. Don't pretend like you have something you don't. So for those who do, who have been doing this work, they will be sharing and answering questions. And those who are wondering about whether they should be doing this work and how to enter into it, how to do, you know, what is required, like what... Okay, what have you guys done? What have been the game changers in your faith walk and why? So I have a list of questions for them to consider as well. And we're going to do that at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you'd like to join us, leave a comment. You can also email me at carrie at drcarriehorn.com, C-A-R-R-I-E at D-R-C-A-R-R-I-E-H-O-R-N.com. And if you can't make it tomorrow, you can let me know if this is something that would benefit you. But there's not much time, you guys. There really isn't. We're between the fourth and the fifth trumpet. No one repents after the fifth trumpet. That means that in this time, you must return to God. You must. There is a very clear separation that that sword, that double-edged sword is doing. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that's exactly how he's doing it. That's exactly how he is separating. He is cutting out those who do not belong. Don't think that that's like, you know, that's not something I'm making up. I'm not making it up to scare you or something. I hope that you have a reasonable amount of fear of God. But he already told us this is what he was going to be doing, separating the wheat from the tares. You just may not have realized it was going to happen in your lifetime. Or that it was going to happen this early on in the seven-year period. I didn't realize that. I thought it would happen at the end. But 
the bottom line is the word is the word. And it says no one repents after the fifth trumpet. And we know that that happens in the middle of the seven year period after the witnesses have died. So everyone's got to be brought in before then. And then during the Antichrist reign, you're going to be working out your covenant. You're going to be put through the fire, as is written in Daniel 11, to be made purified, spotless, and refined. Why, you ask? Well, it depends on how long it took you to return to him. Some people are going to be here longer and some people shorter. And you better hope that you're going to be here shorter because it's not going to be a good time. I think that it would be a good example to you if you looked at what's happening right now in Israel. If you looked at what's going on and the stupid counterfeit Christians who give their approval for murder and bombing and the concentration camp that has become Gaza, that they stupidly stand by. They don't even know their own word, giving their approval for all of that for people who actually believe in Christ. So they join themselves with people who vehemently deny Christ, accuse Christians of changing their law in in favor of them against and in favor of the murder of people who actually profess Christ, people who actually believe in him. They may be misinformed, just like the Samaritans were, but they believe in Christ and they believe that he is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. So you should be able to look at that and see, you know, prior to this, we maybe didn't, couldn't have even comprehended, like, how is this even going to look? How is it that this antichrist kingdom of counterfeit religion is going to join together and just kill people? Like, that's got to be so far off, right? Huh. Right. Until now. Until now, you see it right in front of your face. If you can't see that, please pray that you can see it. Because when Christians or those professing to be Christians who are liars and hypocrites, when they start standing by and giving their approval for murder, you know the time is near. You know that these are the very people who are going to stand by and give the approval for your death, for your torture, that that is the Antichrist. That is the Antichrist reign. And so if we see it happening right now, and there's it, it's unrelenting, you see it happening right now, you should be able to conceive of what's going to happen in two years. You should be able to understand. But then again, only the wise will understand, the wicked will not. So what are you supposed to be doing right now? You need to get in tight with God. You got to figure it out. If you are not in with him, if you came to this channel looking for something, don't think, please, don't think for a second that, okay, what Carrie says is true, so as long as I keep listening to her, I'm good. No, that's not my message. My message is not about gaining followers for myself. My message is you've got to return to God. My message is not pay tithing, contribute to my channel, so a blessing. My message is return to God. That's the only thing that should matter to you at this point in history. And I know that there are people who are looking at their, you know, maybe their loved ones or others in the body, and they're saying things like, I'm just not getting it. I wish that I was getting it over and over, by the way. I want to tell you right now, stop that. First of all, don't do that in our Sabbath, because that is a time for worship. You need to bring that to workshop, and you need to be specific about your questions. Stop grumbling that you're not getting it, and start looking at what is going on. You're not removing the idols in your life because if you were, God would return to you and he would move you. You need to sit down and dig deep and get rid of those idols because if you've got one hiding out that you're not willing to get rid of, that's the one. That is the one that's keeping you in that position. If you're showing up to workshop and you're saying, I don't get it, still struggling, if you're doing that, I want you to know that the time is coming when people who are doing that are not going to be, they're just, you know, if you're doing that over months and you're not even consistent, you're not going to be welcome to join us until you've made the decision about whether or not you want to heal, whether or not you're really going to do, take the instruction because it's a waste of my time. It's a distraction for the process. And I'm not talking about when people first come in, I'm talking about people who come to the workshop, pop in here and there make excuses about why they can't be there, and then pop in and say, still don't get it. I want you to understand why this bugs me so much, because you're making a liar of God. That's, that's the bottom line. So if you say that and I say, okay, so what's God telling you? And you say, well, I don't hear from him. You're, you're making a liar of God. The tools are here. I, the tools are here. The shepherd is here. The body is here to testify. You're seeing that the body is changing. So if you're not changing, that's on you. That is because of you. And so 
what I expect is that you're going to come and bring specific questions. Let me give you an example of a specific question. As I was doing the, the inner child writing, I realized that I was having trouble connecting and here's where I was writing and I noticed this. Like you got to track with yourself. I'm not a mind reader. I don't have a crystal ball. That's not what a shepherd does. A shepherd is here to come alongside you. But if you're getting stuck and you don't even have a specific question to bring, then I'm going to understand that you've not ev- you're not even tracking with yourself. You're not even accountable enough to bring your questions. And that you're not asking God, like you're not attuning yourself to him. I'm going to assume that you're trying to control the work in your flesh and I and the book tell you that that's not going to work, that you have to get into your heart and spirit. Stop grumbling about what's not happening and start looking at what do I need to do? Because when it comes down to it, you're not going to be able to stand in front of Jesus and say, well, I I couldn't get it. I didn't get it. How are you going to do that? This is challenging work because it has to be done in the heart and spirit. And so what I noticed from having worked as a psychologist where we're always telling people to do work in their flesh, right? Write this out and, uh, you know, examine this thought. So anyone will do work in the flesh. Like they will work super hard in their flesh. But when it comes down to like really being in the heart and spirit, that's difficult. That's very hard, especially for those who are, doing things during the day where they're getting into their flesh all day long. Like, for example, they're always on technology or they eat a lot of sugar, drink a lot of caffeine. They use anxiety. Some people don't even realize that they do this. They'll use anxiety or their to-do list or productive behavior. They'll use that to motivate themselves in order to keep themselves detached from the heart and spirit and living in the flesh. And you have to know that you won't heal that way. And you won't hear from God that way. It's impossible for you to hear from God because he tells you to be disciplined in your flesh. He tells you that the flesh fights against the heart, excuse me, against the Holy Spirit. He tells you that the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he tells you that when he makes you a new creation, that he takes out your heart of stone, puts in you a heart of flesh and places his spirit in your heart. So where do you think he wants you to live? If you're living in your flesh and you're trying to control your healing in your flesh, you're going to get worse. I can promise you that. You will get worse, not better. That is, that and and the absence of God, those are the reasons why mental health does not help. It can't. It can't possibly help. So if you want to know more about how to heal, come to the meeting. If you can't make it, let me know that you're interested and when you would like to come, when you have the availability to come. And I will put something together for those who are interested but couldn't make it to this one. Thank you for listening. Please discern with God.